a friend of mine wasn't able to cope with the, my diagnosis of depression. She didn't come to see me when I was in hospital. She didn't return my calls. And she just didn't want to seem to have anything to do with me. And I was really hurt about this. And I know it was because of me being ill. There was no other reason why she wouldn't get in touch with me. And that was the end of our friendship. If you turn around and say, I'm an alcoholic, or I've used drugs, okay, I'll go to depression, don't walk away, don't want to deal with it. And I find that frustrating. You're protecting yourself, but you do want to let other people know. Okay, you don't want to go put that sign in your jacket saying, look, I'm an alcoholic or a drug abuser or whatever, so everybody knows. Like coming to the social work, you don't put it out on the door. I think there is one place we've got to an actual door, substance abuse. So obviously, if people know where that building is and you go there, obviously you tell them you've got a problem with something. But if you tell like neighbours or friends, you go to a certain place, but they don't know what's actually happening in the place. But don't worry about it. Well, if I told my neighbour that I've come to this place, why do you do that? Well, I've got a mental illness. And they turn back. And I find that be every place you go. If you're nervous or kind of, I'm having a bad day, you just want people to, you want to try and tell them, I've got a mental problem. But you don't want to, because you don't know the person. It's completely a stranger. And I find that if there's more people out there that listen, the less stressful it is for the, the mental person or the drug user or alcoholic. It's like she was saying, if everybody had walked about the labels on them. Mm. Uh, I mean, it would be easier, uh, but the point is you don't want to tell every Tom, Dick and Harry that I've got a problem. I don't want anything more than you have. I just want to have the right to be the same as you. One of the big things is just the attitude of people. I want to be able to say, I'm going to go to that shop and go to that shop. I want to be able to go to the whatever supermarket I want to go to and be able to go there. I don't want to have the barriers to my life that I'm having to live with that I know you don't have when you're able-bodied. Anything else you think we should be going for that we can achieve? Well, I live in a high street, so I would like less traffic. Oh. <laughs> no, I do do your head to flat. Oh. Another pipeline. It's getting people to understand that you're perfectly capable of what you were doing before if just small adjustments are made. If they, are, they actually meet in places you can get into the door. If the door's wide enough. Well, they're putting a well. new cross on the side of the dairy. Yes, I do. There's still a lot of foot crosses around that have to go into the cross. I know, right. because yeah. you can't see the traffic coming but over there, but it is such a lot of traffic coming over there. And that's going to get worse. Yes, The more houses that are built across there, the more and more is going to come in that way. So do you find that difficult when those huge holes are in the road? Does that make it even more difficult for you crossing over from one side to the other? Oh, yes, 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 My name's Ian Chandler and I'm age 64 and I was involved in an accident about well, well over a year ago now, it would have been October 09. The stigma was apparent I think at first, I didn't notice it as much now, at first I thought maybe I was standing out like a sore thumb. People do look at you in a different way, at first people were saying oh he's a bit young, you know, for that sort of thing, to be crippled. Somebody did say the word crippled to me. I'm not exactly a nobody. I was somebody. I'm now an old man, I wear a stick, I suppose. I was a, in a position of power. I'd, first thing every morning, I would have a, a planning meeting and we would plan the day and then I would speak to Glasgow, sometimes London, sometimes Manchester. But mainly, first thing in the morning, to say exactly what we had on, but you never knew what was, life was going to throw you. Like, as I say, Piper Alpha, there was accidents offshore all the time. We had a major airport and things sort of falling out of the sky. I miss words, I lose words. You've got to remember, I've been using words since I was 15 years old. 
And at first I, was get, I would get annoyed with myself, no longer. When I was losing words, it used to really annoy me. It doesn't anymore. I, I've accepted my, just the fact that I'm disabled a wee bit. In the split second, bang, nothing. I knew not, absolutely nothing. I, I woke up and two old ladies were saying, are you all right, Loon? I felt like saying, do I effing look at? I find that other people going about you don't know what's wrong with you, you don't want to tell them. No. Because they're not going to really interested in it. But when you do tell them, they look at you completely differently. Certainly there was a stigma there in having a mental illness. After three years, I now feel able to go back to work. I applied and got the reply that being mentally ill, my chances of getting back would be unlikely. I wasn't good at art at the school, I just couldn't draw to save my life. And just being encouraged coming here, it's made a big difference. This is a release for me. I can just sit down and concentrate on something. It just, just gives you satisfaction at you. Something that I never knew I could do. Sometimes there are certain people just not understand if you've got a mental. Mine is, I would say, well, it's not minor to me. It's a big thing in my life. It started off way back in 1988, and it's just been a... I've had good times, I've had bad times. I'm just recovering at the moment. I've had a really bad time. Some people don't understand. I think we should just get a kick up the bum and get on with it. I am off work at the moment. They ignore you, sort of send you to Coventry. Sometimes you, your illness, you don't want to speak, you want, you want to be shut away from people. But that's, that's not how it should be. Not long term. Certain days, yes, maybe you want to be left on your own. And then the next day you want to sit down and speak to somebody. Well, if somebody has a, more a medical problem, if they end up in well, surgery, people accept that better than if it's a mental illness like I've got. That's the difference. And I find it being off long term sick, I find it hard to go back. I don't understand. And they're just, it's just an understanding thing. They just they have good friends here, come into the centre here. They understand because they're going through something similar. Um, you've got somebody to talk to. If you were to ask me whether I preferred being with mainstream or special needs, I would say special needs. Every day is a new challenge and it's just a lovely challenge to, to face. You feel as if you're making a difference to the children you're working with. Our main concerns is that the child achieves their full potential. We work in school very much on what the children are able to do and build on that, hoping that we'll build their confidence. But as they get nearer to the time of leaving school, often their confidence takes a bit of a knock because they're not sure exactly what's ahead. The young people have their own choices to make and they've got a voice and sometimes you can't make all the decisions for them if they can make their choices known then that's the way you should, should go because if their hearts and what they would like to do will probably find that they make a much better job of it. The head injury that I got, in a way, my, my daughter said was a, a blessing in disguise because it, it changed me altogether. I mean, taught all sorts of things. I have to learn to write again, speak. Uh, speech therapy lady thought it was a, a star. <laughs> I don't know about that. I'm not going 110 miles an hour anymore. I'm slower. Um, I accept that I'm slower, otherwise I just go fut. It's difficult to explain. As I said earlier, I don't want to be that bent old man crossing the square. And I, I try and, when I do walk, I try and put my shoulders back. And I, I remember too, I, 
remember playing football and I remember being in newspapers. I, I don't concede to old age. I don't just concede to being disabled. I can't carry shopping from the supermarket to the square to, take, to get the, the free bus home. So then I have to get a, a taxi, which cost me five or a throw. And the ladies from the social work department put me in for a disablement living allowance, which would pay for my taxis to get me and my shopping home and get knocked back for that because it said we don't take into account uh, food shopping. Um, my daughter suggested I got one of those little trolleys, one little tartan trolley. And of course I, I jokingly lost the head and just said, well, that would be a real concession to old age. You are not on. You will not see me with one of those things. Um, <laughs> so I'm, now I'm, I'm managing. You do get remarks, whether you like it or not, you do get remarks passed. And if you're the sort of person who is easily knocked back with something like that, I hate to think the effect it has on you, you know? And that is very difficult to come to terms with, but you've got to, you've got to go over that. You've got to be strong enough minded to say, I don't care what they say. I am what I am. I'm as good as I ever was. In point of fact, I'm probably better because I'm having to overcome more to get there. <laughs>